Hello, everyone, and welcome to our first Student Affairs Assessment Leader Structured Conversation of 2015, The Evolving Competencies of Student Affairs Assessment Professionals with Gavin Henning, Vice President of ACPA and Associate Professor of Higher Education at New England College. My name is Lisa Endersby, and I will serve as your moderator today. On behalf of the Saul Professional Development Committee, I thank you for participating in today's structured conversation. I also want to thank our presenter, the Saul PD Committee, and Margaret Saltonsall for all for their help in putting together today's presentation. So you heard, again, a little bit of our instructions and a few logistics. So if, please feel free to adjust the size of your chat box on the left to more closely monitor our conversation. We certainly encourage you to participate by asking questions today, sharing comments, and providing feedback through chatting and using the various tools offered in the menu located just above the chat room window. You can insert emoticons into the chat using the show emoticon button, which is that lovely little smiley face just under your name. And you can indicate you've stepped away from the session using the step away from the session button, which is right next to it with the person silhouette and the little clock on it. We'll be primarily using the chat room for questions and comments today. However, if you have a microphone and wish to ask a question or offer a comment, as Mary Lee mentioned, please press the raise your hand icon and we will turn on your microphone. Today's structured conversation will examine essential competencies for student affairs professionals. So three years after Shu and Upcraft began talking about student affairs assessment in 1996 in their book entitled Assessment in Student Affairs, A Guide for Practitioners, Gary Malinay edited a new directions and student services issue regarding student affairs offices. This monograph marked the dawn of the student affairs assessment professional. A subfield of student affairs that evolved out of social science research 25 years ago has evolved into something new and better. As the field has changed, so too have the competencies needed to fulfill this role as the knowledge and skills needed in 2000 were very different than those needed in 2015. Join our interactive discussion today as we explore the competencies needed then, now, and in the future for student affairs assessment. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our presenter today. Gavin Henning, PhD, is an Associate Professor of Higher Education at New England College where he also directs the Master of Science in Higher Education Administration and the Doctorate of Education programs. Prior to his transition to faculty, Gavin spent over 20 years in higher education administration with experience in residential life, judicial affairs, alcohol, institutional research, and assessment. Gavin's scholarship has been published in professional journals and scholarly magazines, and he has been an invited speaker at regional, national, and international conferences. His scholarly interests include student engagement, student success, along with assessment and institutional effectiveness. He's been involved in ACPA, where he's currently the vice president. In addition to this role, Gavin has served on the governing board, on the convention planning team, and as a commission chair. Gavin is also a board member for the Council of the Advancement of Standards in Higher Education, CAS, where he also serves on the executive committee as member at large for outreach. In addition, Gavin is the founding member of Student Affairs Assessment Leaders, an international organization for professionals coordinating student affairs assessment. He's been he has been received the annual Copertus Award and has been named a Diamond Honoree from ACPA for his contributions to student affairs and higher education. So without further ado, Gavin, the floor is yours. Great. Thanks, Lisa. Greetings from the uh, land of snow and cold. We have now had three feet of snow in the last three weeks. We're expecting another snowstorm this weekend. And it was a balmy four degrees when I came to work this morning. So my next job will definitely be in a southern state, a warm climate, or California. So thanks for joining us. This is actually going to be more of an unstructured conversation because it's really going to be about having you all share your thoughts um, around what are the evolving skills and knowledge that um, folks need that are doing assessment. When I was asked to do this session on standards, um, I wasn't really wasn't sure what to do. Um, I thought about the CAS standards, and I figured most people in SAL would know about the CAS standards. I thought about um, the professional competencies, and I figured most people would know about that. And so I put it out on the listserv, and I got some great feedback, and folks said it would be, would be really interesting to talk about the specific skills and maybe some standards of skills for folks in this position. I'm like, fantastic. Let's go for that. So I've got some guiding questions um, that will kind of give it, go, make us go, lead us through the next hour. And my hope really is once we kind of get some ideas on what skills we're going to need today and tomorrow, really think about so how can Sal help folks develop that. So I'm really looking for this to be both a conversation but also an action-oriented conversation where we can leave this with some really um, good ideas for the professional development committee. 
And so that's kind of where we are at this point. And so it, um, what I want to do is really kind of think about when the, um, back in the early 2000s when this field really started getting going, I want you to think back for folks that were doing assessment at that point and think about what were the, the different skills and knowledge that were needed at that time. So I'm going to ask folks to raise your hand to chime in and tell me what, kind of, what skills are needed about 25 years ago to do this work. Looking for folks to chime in. Hi, Gavin. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yep. Okay. Um, this is Darby at Texas A&M, and I would say way back in the olden days, one of the really, really basic um, skills was about methodology and quantitative analysis, um, a little bit of qualitative analysis, but much more quantitative. And then the ability to collaborate with people um, across the division who would be doing assessment, and then really developing a process for assessment, because I don't think before I started in this, this work, there was really a process that folks knew how to go through systematically to do assessment. Yeah, so I remember back in the time, and it really was just applying research techniques to this thing called assessment. At that point, I just remember the shooting up that books that we had. So there really wasn't a much, much guidance beyond that. Um, and so I think it really was about applying research skills and knowledge to do to this assessment idea, which folks didn't really have a handle on yet, um, and really trying to define it, just like you said, Darby. Other thoughts? And I'm wondering if you have some thoughts you want to chime in on. Yeah, I actually was trying to think of, um, that seems like such a long time ago, and I can't believe I've been in the field this long. Um, I remember early on a, a, a lot of what the questions were and what some of the skills were, and this is a little bit different direction, um, is there seemed to be a lot of emphasis leaning towards um, there was satisfaction, and then we moved in the direction of learning outcomes. Um, so looking at just some basic ways to uh, write learning outcomes, to measure outcomes, and what that meant to assessment. Yeah, I would agree. I remember starting, there was a lot, everything was satisfaction, and, and we used satisfaction as a proxy for learning, because uh, really we didn't know what else to to assess until we started having a, a conversation across higher education about learning and learning outcomes. Right. So and, that and we that really kind of, oh, go ahead. No, I was going to say, and then I think we probably swung in the other direction, and hopefully we're back now into um, a, a, a bit of a, a middle ground. Um, but also, I, I think the point was, with, with Darby made a good point about, you know, it was really we were trying to do an applied research to social science skills. Right, exactly. Yeah, and I, I agree that we kind of we were at the, the, the satisfaction place, and I think then we came to the movement around learning outcomes, and we probably went swung a little bit too much towards learning outcomes and leaving a lot of the other assessment types out, um, outside of what we were, our focus was. Um, but it really was, I think, applying those research skills, and I think those of us that started back then got into the field because we liked doing research, but we wanted it to be more applied. So when we think about that's where we were, what are the kind of the skills that we that folks think we need today, right now? What are the skills that we're being called on to use in our jobs? And I'd love to open it up to anybody that would like to answer this question. I'll start calling on people if they uh, if folks aren't going to jump in. Gavin, I can chime in a little bit. Being somewhat sure. newer to, to the field of assessment, uh, one thing that I've noticed, it really is a, an overarching skill that's necessary in data analysis. 
Uh, and we talked a little bit about that in your first question where there really is that understanding of quantitative analysis and understanding, uh, I guess, numbers and statistics. But now there's also a real emphasis on understanding and analyzing qualitative data. Um, how do we make sense of open-ended question responses? How do we make sense of focus group responses, interview responses? Um, so the need for good skills and data analysis is still there, but I think it's expanded um, from before up to now. Other thoughts? Feel free to use the chat box or, the, uh, or chime in. Um, so Maureen Cochran said project management and understanding of organizational development culture. Yeah, so our the skills are expanding beyond um, pure assessment or research skills. Um, Ashley talked about assessment processes at the divisional level, looking at metrics, student learning, strategic planning, and program review. So a much more comprehensive assessment. Um, I think we're seeing, at least when I look at job descriptions and when people talk about their positions, an expansion into planning um, planning responsibilities as well as assessment responsibilities. Uh, Joanne mentioned synthesizing data uh, from SLOs um, and across all types of um, assessment, including satisfaction and key performance indicators to really help understand what the story is, how to use data to tell the stories of the student experience or help us understand how do we go about and foster student learning better or actually improve the student experience. Other thoughts? I see Jasmine would like to chime in. Jasmine, your audio is off. Hi. I'm currently here in South Sunny, Florida, so <laughs> I want to thank you for coming your way. <laughs> and yes, I'm, I'm actually new to the field as well to assessment. I'm, I'm working on my doctoral study, and part of it is I'm looking at student engagement, and I'm using um, a predictive model analysis. So I feel that assess I decided to go more with the quantitative aspect of my dissertation. Um, and then later in the future, I would hope to you know, incorporate qualitative. But my program is very heavy on qualitative. And for me, I feel that in assessment, it's important that looking at all the divisions and all the, apart all the departments, each university is different. So when you frame the question, what skills do you think are needed for the job, I think each job is unique in its sense. But in a, in a, um, just in a global aspect, I think more of we should consider ourselves researchers um, in these areas so we can gain more respect and more valuable, um, more value in terms of what, what we're producing. And then also with uh, assessment in student affairs, sometimes it's a, it's a little difficult to um, do assessment because assessment has been done traditionally um, this certain way, and when you come in and you're new and you want to incorporate new aspects of it, um, it's important to really outline and have a good research design and to really understand the interests and the needs of all the stakeholders. So um, I feel that, that that's a big area where I think that we could work in because each academic department or university is its own city, it's its, it has its own you know, entities and constituents. and so. One of the big things is how do you uh, customize a research design that is applicable to the population that you want to work with. So that's, those are my comments. Great. Thanks, Jasmine. And Judge has shared in the, um, in the chat box that the foundational skills are still important. We need broader technology and communication skills and be able to present and represent the findings. I think it's, that's really important. Um, to be, if we can't demonstrate or show the two data, then people aren't going to really understand. Uh, Maury also chimed in again, reporting differently for different audiences. How do you slice and dice that information um, so people can understand it, um, both in terms of uh, what they may be interested in, but also in terms of their sophistication and what, um, how you want, maybe need to make some information either more basic or more sophisticated. And we need to really help people make the connections. When I talk with folks and look at what I see, I, I'm, almost, I'm seeing um, a, an expanded skill set need, being needed to do assessment, particularly for folks that are assessment coordinators. I think there's a lot more need where originally it was about the technical skills, um, which were really about the applied research. I think then they, the, the evolution then was into um, technical skills um, because the use was really about tapping into databases um, and using some of that existing knowledge for assessment purposes. And now what I've noticed over the last few years is that people need to have a lot more people skills. 
and because this is a position where we really need to uh, collaborate with folks and be able to motivate folks to do assessment. Um, and we don't have, um, assessment coordinators don't necessarily have the legitimate power or supervisory power to do that. So we need to tap into um, our relationships with folks, other ways to be able to connect with folks to help them do assessment and actually move forward in that. So it seems like the currently the skill set and the knowledge set is, is much more expanded both in depth as in, um, and, and in depth. And so it's really interesting because it's almost like the assessment person has to be, um, has to do everything in many ways. And you have to know, you have to know about all the different types of functional areas, all the different needs, and still have some, some very high sophisticated technical skills to be able to do this. And as there's been some, con some conversation through the listserv over the last couple of months, particularly around the, bit, the use of big data and be able to combine data across the institution, it seems like even the research skills are going to become more sophisticated. So Jasmine, as you talk about doing, using predictive modeling, some of the basic skills that we may have learned in our master's program or even maybe in some of our doctoral programs aren't going to be sufficient anymore. So we're going to need even more sophisticated um, statistical analysis when we're doing quantitative assessment. So let's take a look back at, so uh, Michael had mentioned that um, we also have to be able to teach people how to do assessments. So then there's this educational piece. Um, and I think we've also seen that with some positions, assessment positions also have professional development in them. And so the folks need to be able to, to interact with other people as well as educate folks. And so there's, a, there's definitely a, a wide skill set. Aaron chimed in that, that budgetary expertise. So you really need to understand the budget process really, really need to understand the impact of assessment on budgets because really assessment is a political um, activity mainly because it, it revolves around resource allocation. And so you, um, assessment first people really need to understand how that impacts the, the, the budget process and how you can use data to both um, defend resources and advocate for more. Um, and I mentioned the use of various te technology tools. I would say probably in the last five years, there are a lot more tools than we've ever had in the past. The first tools we had were online survey tools. Now there's a lot more tools that allow us to do a lot of things. And as Mary Lee mentioned, social media is key, both in terms of collecting the data, but also as well as getting the data out. And so uh, there need to be some sophistication around that. I already mentioned politics. Who has power and who needs the information? And it's interesting because as this is really a political um, activity, it boils down to power. And sometimes the assessment person doesn't have necessarily the legitimate power. They're not the one that supervises. They're not necessarily the one that's necessarily the leadership role in the division, but they do have the power of information. And, it, and trying to understand who needs what information. And really helping the leadership of the division or the leadership in the department have the information they need so then they can actually use that to do the job better. What are some of the other skills that we think we need today? Feel free to use the chat. We'd love to hear your voice. So raise your hand and Mary Lee will let you give you permission to chat. And I'd really love to hear from people that have started doing assessment in the last couple of years and what you're what you realize you needed right away. I think one of the issues that is really prevalent right now is getting people to understand how to use the data they have and how to use the results and put that into practice because, you know, 20 years ago it was as long as you're doing assessment, that's great. But now it's what are you doing with the information that you have to improve your programs or services and how are you documenting that and how you're sharing that with other people. It's a great point, Dar, because I think there's, there, there's a lot of data out there. And when I talk to campuses, one of the things they tell me is we've got tons of data already. We just don't know how to use it and how to get connected and use it for decision making. That's a great point. And Joe Levy wanted to make a comment. Joe, your audio permission's on. All right. Uh, I just wanted to say one of the things that isn't listed here, uh, but we've been circling maybe a little bit, is being an in, uh, you know, using, exerting influence where you don't have um, authority or power. Uh, you know, I'm, 
I'm in a position, I'm the director of assessment, but, uh, you know, faculty, as I'm leading them through assessment processes, they don't report to me, they report to people close. Same thing on the co-curricular side. You know, co-curricular people don't report to me, they report to their supervisors, directors, so forth and so on. So one of the skills that you really need to have in this area is using your, your influence uh, to, to, to onboard them and get them to be doing this work when you don't necessarily have direct authority uh, to hold these people accountable. So Joe, what kind of skills have you used to, to do that, to really um, build those connections and really kind of help folks move forward with assessment when you don't have that, that supervisory power or other types of um, tools? Uh, I, I'd say some of the things people have mentioned already, it's, you know, I, I try to connect with them and, and first learn uh, as much as I can about their their day-to-day -day work and what they typically do. And then look to present them with high-level questions about, you know, well, wouldn't you want to know how students are learning and isn't that important? Uh, and then you know, begin weaving in some assessment concepts and, and taking it slow, but working to build a relationship and and try and tie things in as organically as possible to as soon as possible get them understanding that you know this shouldn't be an assessment project or this shouldn't be you know a project that Joe's making you do, but really it's something they should be wanting to do. You know, especially you know when I, I talk a lot with student services. You know, just as you're so invested in making sure your staff are doing what they're supposed to and that the operational outcomes of your resources and your events are met and that you're tracking you know, these, these things, we should also be looking at what students are walking away with and what, what they're learning from the process because that's equally important uh, as knowing the, um, the operational pieces. And, and really, when they go, when when you have both pieces, then it tells a full story. Uh, and right now, when you know, some areas aren't necessarily able to tell their, that full story, that's a great point, Joe. And I think um, you, some of the things you you hit on that really um, resonated for me is about the relationship building. Um, and so when I started doing this work, I realized it really was more about relationships than it was about data in some ways. Um, and so. Um, and I really thought of myself, um, when I considered what roles I had in this position, I considered my, the, the top role for me was educator. And I think doing exactly what you talked about is helping people see how they can use the data, but also doing some translation so they can see how the data can be used in multiple ways. And I think, Joe, you mentioned um, the, this key piece about now there's more connection between the co-curricular and the curricular. And people on both sides need to understand how that gets connected. And an assessment coordinator can help be that translator to be able to connect those pieces and really can be that conduit between those two sides of the institution and really help to use data that supports the, the overall experience of students. And so I think that's some, uh, that's some key elements. And I think the other, the other thing I thought about when you're, when you're talking was really about being a guide. So rather than pushing people, you want to guide them in the direction towards doing assessment and helping them choose the right path, um, give them some tools about how they need to go down that path. So great, great stuff. Other folks that want to share what they what people need right now. Gavin, we've got some great questions and other uh, skills in the chat box. One that I really liked was from Kristen. She was talking about getting buy-in. And some of that might be a skill, but some of that might be a larger question. How do we create buy-in and what skills do we need to do that well, especially when it comes to recognizing and sharing how important assessment is? Great suggestion. Other folks? Scanning through the... Uh, the chat right now. So people I see some things about organizational understanding, getting buy-in. So that's really again about um, relationship building and be able to help translate why this is important. Why should people put their effort into it? Uh, Rebecca talks about innovative thinking. So how can we really get outside the uh, the, the the old methods of just giving surveys um, and over surveying? See what are some innovative methods folks are using. 
Uh, Gavin, can I say something? Sure, please. So this is, this is something that I have found um, that has really helped me over the years, and this might be something people um, may have the background or maybe could invest in in some way, is I actually started as a student affairs practitioner. I started in residence life, moved my way up, brief life, student activities, and all those traditional functional units. And one thing that has really helped me is understanding what the offices actually do. So I think that's a really important skill to have is, is to understand the day-to-day -day operations the best you can because that goes a lot way with um, collaboration and building those relationships and creating tools, um, assessment infrastructure or whatever else that units might need. Yeah, that's really important. So I think that like, understanding and being able to connect to those units is really, really powerful. Um, I think it really helps, you can, that allows you to be a translator um, even more effectively. Other thoughts about what's needed now, today, for assessment in student affairs? Marlene talks a little bit about persuasion um, as a way of, of connecting with folks and helping them see the value of assessment and really get people to move, go forward with assessment um, especially if you're the division-wide coordinator, you need people to do the assessment, but you have really no other um, power to do that. So persuasion and getting, persuading people to do that is really important. Other thoughts? Uh, Darby mentions the importance of having the assessment agenda. Um, and so what, how does a, what's really the overall plan for moving forward with assessment? And how do you articulate that? How do you be able to connect um, to uh, uh, what's being done in the provost and, pre and president's area? And I think this is even more important today than even before when people are, when the administrative leaders are seeing student affairs more as student services and really about providing services to students and many of which can be outsourced now um, to other uh, folks outside of higher ed, more in the business area, and be outsourced for a lot cheaper rate. And so I think the more that, we, that assessment folks can really help support the divisional assessment work, particularly around student learning and student success, and be able to demonstrate that the mo it's a better positioning, um, the data can be used for the division as well as the, the vice president or the vice chancellor. Um, great point, Debbie. Our folks at uh, SUNY Oswego talk about patience. Creating culture takes time. I always tell folks it's usually a three, at least three to five years to change the culture, generally more, uh, particularly if you get some resistance. And so you got to know you're going to be going in for the long haul. And it's really about um, looking at small victories one step at a time. Um, and each little victory is going gonna, is gonna to be better for us moving to the battle. So we have a really good idea about what's, um, what do we need today. And so what I want to do is really kind of shift now the conversation to what do we need in the future? Thinking five to ten years out, what, what do we think the skills are going to, uh, that we're going to need at that point? So I'd love to hear some of the, from some of the futurists. What are we going to need in the future? So Jason mentions the ability to get students involved in the process. So I think we're going to, yep, we're moving forward, we're going to need to do that. Uh, Aaron mentions big data. How do we really tap into all of the data um, that, we, that we have available? Um, I was on a webinar yesterday, and a colleague of mine, Tony Duty at Rutgers, talked about even tapping into location-based data when students are scanning the buildings and using services to understand how are, what services are they using, how are they moving about campus. Um, so, yeah, we're going to have to figure out how to use big data. Yeah, I think Maureen talked about the uh, need for data analysis. I think it's going to get deeper and more sophisticated. Um, moving into analytics and what are the, are people going to have the skills to do that? And then uh, Kristen McKinney uh, over at UCL talks about the ability to clone ourselves and pause time so we can get it all done. And so I think we're going to fall into the same pattern that student affairs has been in the past where things just get piled on and unless the staff increases um, or as Darby mentioned, you can really utilize technology. We've got to figure out how to manage all that. There are going to be a lot more 
um, requests for time and demands as more and more expectations are being um, set for using data to make decisions. And so how do we do that? Um, Mar Marilee talks about social media again. Um, we need to begin assessing assessments. Are the assessment practices actually working? Um, Lisa's talking about we got to make sure to be connected to our stakeholders. How, um, how in involved in the assessment process are they? Talk about re relevance of student affairs, as we just talked about a few minutes ago. Cole is talking about public relations and graphic communications. How are we sharing the information, getting it out there? Um, the students, prospective students, parents, other external stakeholders could be legislatures, policymakers, particularly as, as we may see, at least in terms of the, the, the federal level discussions around program-based funding and what's been happening in Tennessee where the, the, tuition, the budgets for the institutions are being based on graduation rates, not necessarily the number of students going. And so there's going to be more connection. How do we use student data to uh, foster student success? And so there's going to be more connection, I think, using data for those legislatures. And so they're going to, assessment folks are going to need to be a little keener on communication skills. And be able to do that in forms that are not 40 page reports, um, because that's going to be just too overwhelming. Uh, Judd says stress management skills are going to be important. Yes. I think everybody should take up mindfulness and learn how to meditate. That might be helpful. And then Darby really mentioned the, uh, the two words I like to talk about in terms of effective and efficient. And so we really need to demonstrate and increase the effectiveness and efficiency of the resources we're using. Budgets aren't going to increase. Um, staff likely won't increase. So how are we doing that? And Rebecca is talking about the ability to translate assessment results into actions and program changes. So great stuff from the chat room. I'd love to hear some folks' voice, people willing to, to share their thoughts. You know, I'd like Perfect. to say, this is Mary Lee, and I'd like to say something about accreditation. And I think it even um, speaks to current needs, but definitely future needs. Um, with increased uh, focus on accountability and data um, and just the things kind of coming out of accreditation bodies, I think being aware of standards of your regional accreditation bodies so we as, as student affairs professionals can support those accreditation efforts. Yep. It would be interesting to see where that goes um, in, with the with new Congress because um, Lamar Alexander is talking about actually deregulating to an extent at least financial aid. And he's been, in the past, he's been a little critical of accreditation, but it seems like he's been pulling back. And I wonder if there's going to be, if he's going to be thinking about how to make regulation, even the accreditation process different. So it would be interesting to see how that plays out. But I think there's still going to need to be some version of quality assurance that's going to happen um, in some type of mandated way. And so I think the, the more that um, student affairs units can get ahead of that, and demonstrate how they're assuring quality and effective, effectiveness and efficiency, it's going to be even better um, for Division of Student Affairs and really position the Vice President well to advocate and defend resources. Other thoughts? So Cole actually mentioned about the, um, as Student Affairs is being viewed as a soft skill development, there may be a need for curriculum development and evaluation uh, as a skill. You know, and I also wonder, think about are our students, um, as, do they have, are they leaving with the skills to use data the way they should? Um, it's going to be a data-driven society, so it seems like we need to be able to provide the skills to students to do assessment and evaluation, decide, be able to decide what data is valuable and what, what are the parameters for, for making that decision. You know, it's not just the first hit after a Google search is, is the best data. So how do you make some decisions regarding that? And Jasmine talked about the need to understand the hybrid forms of the college campus. Um, yeah, we're going to have uh, most of our students right now are in community colleges. Um, they're going to be, there's going to be an increasing move towards online students, both in terms of in increasing access, um, but also in terms of um, cost in, um, in fund or cost in um, 
reducing the cost in delivering the education. So we need to figure out how do we actually do assessment in those, um, in those environments? And how do we really move to these e-learning um, e platforms, maximizing those, um, possibly looking at competence-based competence learning? And so there's going to be some new um, frontiers that we need to expand the skill and knowledge on. Joe, I see your hands up, so your permissions enabled. Awesome. Uh, one of the other things I would say about future need is and, and maybe this, you know, this falls a little bit into what Kevin was just saying, as well as the idea of engaging stakeholders and partners. But um, you know, looking to make sure assessment is, and, and people doing assessment have, are included in higher level conversations. Uh, you know, we, we talk about you know, e-learning platforms and, and making sure that assessment is adapting. But you know, really, one of the best ways to do that is. You know, if you're considering an LMS or if you're um, looking to put out new uh, services to, to at your institution or to students that somebody from assessment is giving that perspective of, oh, you know, it'll be great if we can, you know, make sure that we have you know, tracking on, you know, when students click on this link or, you know, are we able to insert this and, and have these analytics. Um, because otherwise, then what happens is if assessment is a part of those conversations, then when it comes to trying to assess those things, you have this process that then you have to try and work around. So I think in the future, and, and this isn't necessarily something from an assessment side, you can, uh, I mean, you can try and advocate for. I think it's more um, something that across universities they'll, they'll have to try to appreciate and, and respect is that you know, assessment should be a consideration and sometimes, or at least I think currently, it isn't as uh, common of a consideration. Uh, but I think in the future it should be um, because assessment ties in everywhere. It ties in with, with curriculum. It ties in with student services. And so as you think about the different things that can, and services that can come about, and the priorities and direction and you know, university initiatives, you know, assessment should be a thought um, and, and if, that, if it's not a thought by the people who are in those positions, you know, having those conversations, then having somebody with that assessment uh, perspective there is, is helpful because it's obviously on that person's side. It's a great, great point, Joe. And I think it's, uh, we really need to continue to advocate for the inclusion of assessment in everybody's job responsibility um, because it, it ch shouldn't re fall to one person, and really the more responsibility folks have across the division, across the institution, the more that it's going to be, um, it's, it's going to be used. Uh, Morgan has a great point about uh, more publications, and so really increasing the scholarship. And so the interesting thing is, in about in the next year and a half to two years, there are at least four to five assessment books that I'm aware of that will be coming out. And so there will be more, um, more tools, more thoughts. Um, regarding student affairs assessment in the coming years. Um, I'm actually really jealous about what's happening now because um, as I mentioned, when, when I started doing this, sitting on an assessment committee in 1997 and then starting full time in 2000, there was one book. That was it. And, there, and really there wasn't, there was nothing written about assessment even across the institution. So really it was taking research methods, skills and trying to figure out some way to apply that. And so it was a lot of uh, figuring out as you go along. Um, and so I think it's going to be great to see some the increase in scholarship in books, but I would love to see uh, perhaps this group provide some more scholarship in terms of white papers or smaller thought, thought pieces or discussing best practices um, that we can really build on and, and uh, pull from each other. Take one more minute or two for any final um, comments our statements regarding what's needed in the future, and then we'll kind of transition to, so what can SAL do to help folks develop these skills and knowledge? Any final thoughts before we move on to that topic? Okay, so let's move on. So let's kind of move to the action part of our conversation in the next 14 minutes, according to my clock. So let's give some ideas to the SAL Professional Development Committee. So what can SAL do? And we can also think about the, uh, the, the NASA um, Assessment Evaluation Research Knowledge Community and the 
in the ACPA Assessment Evaluation Commissions, we have members of both of those groups on the call today. And so what can we do? What can any of those organizations provide to help us with these skills? Um, one thing we talked about is more scholarship. And so I think those might be um, some things to think about in terms of what, what kind of scholarship can it look like? What, what, what is useful? Other suggestions, what Sal can do. Hey, Gavin, this is Darby. And I want to put in a plug for both the ACPA ASK standards and the NASPA ACPA competencies, um, because I think those also give good parameters about what we need to know, um, although they're meant for non-assessment professionals necessarily, but I think it really gives us a good foundation about what we need to know and where we need to be for those of us that are doing assessment full time. And then it gives ideas for professional development, particularly the competencies, because it gives you basically a rubric of basic, intermediate to advanced. And that's a fantastic guide for what are we doing in terms of conference presentations or the NASPA Assessment and Persistence Conference or the ACPA Assessment Institute. And I think how we can engage SAL members in those events as well to build our skills so that we can go back and build the skills of all of our people on campus. That's a great idea. I think the competencies provide a really strong curricular foundation for it, like as you said, what we need to do, but also in terms of as we go out there and educate other folks. Great suggestion. You know, and I like the, I'm glad you mentioned the the ACP and the NASPA assessment conferences because I think there's some really useful stuff there. It would be great to be able to capture some of that in some type of publication um, to share with people that weren't able to attend because I think there might be some good stuff that's going out there. Linda's actually, or Lisa's actually talking about how do we, we can expand the discussion of the scholarship using blogging, more webinars and conversations like this, which are really easy to facilitate, not a lot of prep, um, and really try to fill the gaps of the books. Because books take a lot of time. And, um, and so how do we do it in a more um, easier, low-tech version to get some of the information out there? Other suggestions for what Sal can do or what ACPA or NASPA can do? Love to hear some folks' voice. So Judge suggested maybe looking at at least the skills, trying to cluster them together. So create themes that can serve for topics for blogs future structured conversations. You know, maybe we need to have a SAL blog with guest bloggers at different times. So it's really not onerous for one person to blog a lot, but provide opportunities for more, more folks to, to get in. And Jason talks about higher level skills, moving from introductory to basic, um, for, um, be, moving beyond that. And I know the, at least a few years ago, um, I'm sure they still do it. The NASPA Assessment Persistence Conference actually had some really intense uh, pre-conference sessions on some really specific skill sets. And so maybe we need to think about how can we do that either through ACP or NASPA or AIR, because um, they really have some of the skill in that area and really tap into some colleagues um, across the academy that can do that. Some great conversations about Bridging, um, working across institutions or between institutions to talk about competency-based education. Um, Joanne mentioned the kind of re reiterated the idea for shorter versions of scholarship that we might want to share because uh, the folks we're working with probably aren't going to read books, um, but will they read a blog post or a, a short three to five page um, white paper? Uh, Gavin, I also kind of going back to, I'm glad you mentioned um, the Association of Institutional Research and kind of going across the academy. Um, I have found that there, you know, I think sometimes we get, we think about student affairs assessment and we kind of get in that world, but um, there are many other organizations that we can draw knowledge from um, and, and that helps us adapt our work. So I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because I do think there's some other places that uh, we can we can get some uh, some skills. 
great point, Aaron. So it really requires Sal to kind of reach out to some of the other organizations besides ACPA and NASCAR. Yeah, great point. You know, I think that, and the other thing we want, I want to make sure we keep in mind too is that while I think there's still going to be a pendulum switch back to a focus on quantitative assessment like there was back in the early 2000s, I think we can't forget the benefit of qualitative um, assessment. So we thinking about are there some other organizations we can tap or other folks that have some expertise in qualitative research skills that we, we can really pull from to really boost up the skill sets that we have. So Maureen mentioned one group with the American Evaluation Association, so that might be good for program evaluation resources. What else can SAL do to help folks develop these skills? So Michael mentioned that folks at uh, Loyal Chicago and Nepal have an assessment certificate program. That's a great idea for helping folks develop skills. So you just talked about the, uh, the RPA journal. So that's great. I think that comes out of the Virginia assessment group. Um, some really good stuff in there. Uh, so we don't need to recreate the re wheel. We can just tap into that. Sal members can contribute or collaborate. Joe's got some ideas, so we just need to give him permission to speak. All right. Uh, I think one of the other things we can do, one of the ways that we can uh, move forward on some of these ideas is to uh, utilize future, whether they're meetings, discussions, or emails to, as somebody mentioned before, look at these themes, look at these topics, and challenge ourselves to say, hey, who who wants to dive in or who wants to try and take on this topic? Because uh, I'm sure you know, within assessment, we all have our own passion areas or things that maybe we're interested in. And so, you know, putting it out to the group, you know, it, you know, without, you know, instead of saying, oh, well, we should, you know, it'd be great if we have more research. You're know, seeing, well, who's interested in writing an article on this? And, and then, you know, pairing up so that, you know, it's not just somebody soldiering on by themselves. Um, but that you know they, they they know some of the people or that you know, who's interested in putting together you know presentations on these various topics um, and you know that potentially could also go towards as some people mentioned before you know setting up uh, mentoring opportunities uh, but creating that space to to recap some of these topics or some of these trends and challenging the group to to speak up to see who's interested and, and see what then you know, the side groups or sub sub conversations and efforts can, can come about from that. Great, Joe, and that really chimes well with uh, what Jasmine mentions in terms of self can help by creating innovative spaces for the knowledge sharing, um, scholarship training, discussions, seminars. So really, how do we figure out how do we really crowdsource this um, and really use each other? Um, the structured conversations are great. The listserv is great. But is there a way we could create a collaborative wiki or something else where people can be able to share resources or be able to talk and have some conversations about this um, that might help expand the knowledge and skills of folks? And I think, you know, some of us taking the, the lead and say, hey, I'm willing to learn about this and, and, and teach others. It's a great opportunity to develop individual skill and knowledge, but also be able to, to give back to folks. Other thoughts as we're nearing the, uh, the end of the hour. I thank Lisa for doing an excellent job for getting all this stuff written down. So we have some good ideas, both in terms of recap what the skills and knowledge are, but also the suggestions uh, for what Sal could do, uh, or possibly what ACPA or NASPA could do with their, um, their assessment-based groups. Any final thoughts? It looks like some folks have to ring off so they can head to other meetings. Well, it looks like those are all the suggestions right now. Um, if you have continued suggestions, feel free to email me if you want at gheading at nec.edu um, or post them to the Sal listserv and we'll uh, do a good job to try to um, capture everything that we can. 
Um, thanks for joining today. Hope it was helpful and useful. Um, I enjoyed the conversation, got a lot of great ideas myself. And then also some, um, we have some fantastic ideas to give to the professional development committee so they can um, take those and run with them. Hope everybody enjoys the rest of their Wednesday. Have a marvelous day. Hopefully we'll see you at the SAL meeting um, at ACPA in Tampa where it's going to be sunny and warm. Um, or if not, I'm, I think there's going to be a, a meetup at NASPA in New Orleans as well. And so we'll get that information out there. Our next structured conversation, uh, sharing data and marketing results with the brilliant Mike Christakis, uh, Vice President for Student Success at the University of Alameda. Uh, that will be amazing. Um, so Mike will do a great job. So that's all for today. Thanks a lot. Have a great day and talk to you soon. Bye.